Greetings in peace, and welcome this fine summer evening of God's creation to Messiah Lutheran Church. We hope you feel the presence and warmth of our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as we praise him in song and in prayer this evening. We do have a couple of announcements this evening. I know, it's tough. Okay. I raised three kids. I could probably project, but <laughs> my name is Nancy Homan, and I am here on behalf of the Altar Guild. Uh, we are looking for people who would be willing to help serve on the Altar Guild. This is the group that prepares the Holy Communion for the services every weekend. It's a modest time commitment, about an hour on Saturday morning usually to set everything up and then 20 minutes or so to reset after this 5.30 service and after the first service on Sunday morning when we're back to our two-service schedule, and then maybe half an hour to clean up after the second service. It would be easy to pair someone from this service with somebody who normally attends on Sunday and have you work together. You know, we're very flexible, but if we can get a minimum of three more teams then each team would only need to be serving about every six weeks. And so that's a very doable time commitment. I have found it to be a very spiritually enriching ministry. I came on the altar guilt. I was trying to remember when, and I can't remember when. I've been having so much fun, you know. <laughs> but it's, it's been a few years now. Um, I would ask that you prayerfully consider this. I would be more than happy to answer questions. We will provide training and written guidelines. A couple times a year we get together and everybody works together to polish brass and silver before the Advent season and before Easter. Um, and, you know, hanging banners, when changing pyramids, when the seasons change. But with several hands to help with that, it goes really easily and quickly. So please think about it, pray about it. My email is in the messenger, or you can call the church office and they can put me in touch with you. Um, thank you very much for considering. Thank you, John. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Lisa Westland, and I'm here to just talk to the ladies today. I want to call your attention to a little article that was in the spirit about a women's event that's coming up in November, November 9th and 10th. It's sponsored by Fresh Grounded Faith, which is based here in Springfield. And they put on an event Friday evening and Saturday morning that's very similar to a Women of Faith event, if you've ever heard of one of those. But it's just on a more intimate scale because it's right here in Springfield. It will be at Second Baptist Church on Friday evening and Saturday morning. The cost right now, if we can get ourselves organized, is $39 for both days. That's the early bird special price. And I would like to set an arbitrary deadline of August the 12th to have commitments and money to me so that we'll be sure to get tickets because this event sells out every single year. But I think it's going to be a lot of fun. We can carpool together. We'll have a lot of good fellowship time together. There will be three nationally known speakers and a couple from Ireland who are hymn writers and they have a fabulous worship band. And I think it's just going to be a lot of fun. So I would encourage you to think about that. You can look them up online if you want to learn a little bit more about it. I'm also going to be out in the mission hall after the service this evening to answer any questions or to take your, um, your statement that you are willing to come and, and participate with us. I think it'll be a lot of fun, a good way for us girls to stick together a little bit. Thank you. Let us pray.
Please rise if you're able. <clears throat> Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin and whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open and all desires are known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins and known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please share the gift of peace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us pray. God of the covenant, in our baptism you call us to proclaim the coming of your kingdom. Give us the courage you gave the apostles that we may faithfully witness to your love and peace in every circumstance of life. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Um, please be seated. The first reading tonight comes to us from the book of Ezekiel, the second chapter. A voice said to me, O mortal, stand up on your feet, and I will speak with you. And when he spoke to me, a spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. He said to me, Mortal, I am sending you to the people of Israel, a nation of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants are impudent and stubborn. I am sending you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they shall know that there has been a prophet among them, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please read responsively with me the Psalm 123. To you I lift up my eyes, to you enthroned in the heavens, as the eyes of the servant look with the hand of their masters, and the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress. So our eyes look to you, O Lord our God, until you show us your mercy. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy, for we have had more than enough of contempt. Too much of the scorn of the indolent rich and the derision of the proud. The second reading tonight comes from the book of, a second book of Corinthians, the twelfth chapter. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast, but, I, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But if I refrain from it so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of their revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For wherever I am weak, then I am strong. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to Mark at the sixth chapter. Jesus came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets 
are not without honor, except in their hometown, and among their kin, and in their own house, and he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The Gospel of the Lord. May my words be in harmony with the universe, contribute to its justice, enhance its beauty, and help bring us all to peace on the earth. Amen. He came to his own country again. If you remember a few weeks ago, in the third chapter of Mark, he went home. We talked about going home and the problems there. That didn't work out real well for Jesus. Jesus is in full power, and he knows it. He's proven this the past few weeks, our readings. Jesus has been teaching in a boat and on the shore, in full command of his powers. And by that I mean, he stayed in the boat for a reason. Not only so that a lot of people could hear him, but also so that people could not touch him. And if you recall what happened in last week's reading, he got out and was among the people, and a lady who has been hemorrhaging for a dozen years said, if only I can touch his hem, I will be made well. And she summoned up all of this courage and touched the hem of his tunic. And Jesus felt the power go out of him. He felt zapped. That's how much power he had and how much he knew his power. In the past few weeks, we've been traveling with Jesus and the disciples across the Sea of Galilee. He was teaching on the west side, the Jewish side of the, uh, of the sea, and they started to cross. A storm came up, and Jesus calmed the storm. Miracle number one. Got to the other side, and then there was a passage that we didn't read this year. But you might remember the demoniac that lived among the tombs who was called Legion because he had a legion worth of evil spirits within him, and Jesus healed him. And then he came back across from east to west and healed the hemorrhaging woman and raised the little girl. Talitha Kuom, he said, arise, little girl. And so now we're back on this west side and the overriding question that was asked is, was, still is, who then is this that he can do these kinds of miracles? He controls the weather. He controls multiple demons. He can stop bleeding and he can raise the dead. Who then is this? 
certainly a man of great power. And so he goes home again to Nazareth. And the people ask, as he's teaching in the synagogue, where did he get all of this? Where is all of this coming from? What kind of authority does he have to be preaching like this? And remember last time he went home, they thought he was crazy. And what it was was just all of this enthusiasm that he had because he's filled with God. And that's what enthusiasm means, to be filled with God. And he was filled, and they thought he was crazy. I can just see him. He was so animated, so excited about everything that he was doing. And that authority, the Greek word is exousia, which means from out of your very being. And what is the very being of Christ, of Jesus? It's God. Because he is God. And then everybody, all of a sudden, feels very familiar with Jesus. He's the hometown boy. What do they say? Familiarity breeds contempt. And that's pretty close to what they had for Jesus at this time. What do they say? Isn't that the carpenter? Isn't that the, 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 the son of Mary? Isn't that his brothers and sisters hanging around here still? It's like, you know, I remembered him when he was a kid. What does he know? He's one of us. He's no big, big deal. And it said they were offended. A better translation that I read was they were scandalized. Wow. Scandalized by Jesus' presence and his teaching. And he says to them, a prophet is not without honor, except, and this is the only time I think in the Gospels, I keep checking, that Jesus uses the word except. Jesus is very inclusive. But here he uses the word except. A prophet is not without honor, except in his own country. Here we mean a countryside, his kin, his own family, and in his own house. And his own house would have been the city of Nazareth. Ainavi bi iro means there is no prophet in his own city. That's the Hebrew. And was a very popular uh, phrase during the Renaissance. Okay, but this is where it came from. It comes from Mark. As I think about this passage, many of you know, I, uh, I worked as a band director for my career and uh, did a lot of things I was proud of. Came up with some new ideas. I did, we did. And of course, everybody in my building just said, yeah, that's Spaghera. That's him. And people in nearby town said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he's, 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 he's a little bit obsessive about these musical things. Don't pay any attention to him. But if I went 25 miles away from home and someone paid me $25, guess what I became? An expert. I was a professional. I knew everything. I had all the answers. By the way, I did have that experience uh, right here in Springfield uh, last fall. Some band director friends asked me if I'd speak, and seriously, I mean, that's what happened. These people going, yeah, this guy really knows his stuff. It's the same old me. But that's what Jesus was experiencing. He called it unfaithfulness. Apistia. Anytime an A is thrown in front of a Greek word, it means without. 
An atheist is without God. An agnostic is without knowledge. Okay, apistia, you're without faith. I think it's more than that. I think it's negativity. Negativity and unfaithfulness. And there are two sides to one coin. And that's why Jesus could not do the job that he'd been doing. Remember, four heavyweight miracles he just performed. Jesus knows his powers. He knows what he's doing. He knows the authority that he has. And he comes among his own people, who are rather negative about this, and he can do nothing. They have zapped his powers. They've zapped his powers far more than the woman who bravely touched his hem. You uh, see on the overhead a flower garden overrun by weeds. And this is a great metaphor for exactly what Jesus was dealing with. I wish I could say I came up with this metaphor. I did not. It's a nuttest metaphor. I also wanted to put her picture up here, and she said, absolutely not. I just wanted to give credit. It's her metaphor. And she always says, if you don't keep up with the weeds, the weeds take over the garden. So we have to get rid of the weeds. The weeds, the weeds are that negativity, and we have to get rid of it so that the positivity of the beautiful flowers or the gorgeous vegetables can be there. Great metaphor. My dad always used the word negativity, and he would remove himself from situations where there was negativity. He was very sensitive to negativity, and he'd just remove himself. He'd say, I'm out of here. I'm not going to be around this kind of negativity. It's not good for me, and it's not good for any of us. And obviously, it wasn't even good for Jesus. His powers are zapped. These great four miracles that are, that are surrounded by that question, who then is this? And those people had an answer. It's yeah, just Jesus. It's no big deal, it's just Jesus. So he did a few healings. I can't help but think these healings were maybe like someone who had a hangnail, okay? Someone who had a stubbed toe. Because that's all they left him with. The negativity left him only with that power. And so he left that place wisely and went about the countryside with the twelve, with the disciples. And again, the twelve representing God's governance, the new governance of Israel right there with those twelve. And he called them together and he sent them out two by two. feel like I should break into song now, but I won't. I promised Annette that I wouldn't. He sent them out two by two. If you think about it, he could have covered a lot more territory sending them out alone, right? Send 12 out alone can cover more area than sending them two by two. But Jesus knew what he was doing, of course. And what he knew was Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy calls, in 17, uh, chapter 17, verse 6, on the evidence of two witnesses, not one, two, will the testimony be relevant. And the testimony being talked about in Deuteronomy is putting someone to death pretty serious stuff. 
And this is what Jesus is doing. So that the testimony will be valid. He sends them out two by two. But I think he sent them two by two for another reason. A couple of weeks ago I mentioned, we're all in this together. We're all in the same boat. If we look up, we see that that's true. And so they go out two by two. And he gave them authority. There's that word again, exousia. He gave them authority, the authority that he had from his very being, he gave to the 12 of them. He wasn't hoarding it. Okay. This, this story came to me as I, as I prepared this week. Very important story to me. When I was, uh, when I was in school, high school and college, uh, as a music major, I was trained classically, but I had this love of jazz. I really loved jazz and wanted to learn how to improvise, which is the very essence of jazz. And so I went to my high school band director, Red Travis, and he said, ah, you know, you either got it or you don't. You know, you can either do it or you can't. Okay, so I just sort of tried to find things out on my own. And when I got into college, I asked my band director there, Reggie Shive, I said, hey, I'd like to learn more about improvising. And he said, you know what? Either you got it or you don't. You can either play it or you can't. What I'd like to tell you right now, both of them were dead wrong, <laughs> okay? There are six really great schools where that's taught, and most every college that has a music department now teaches it, including right here at Missouri State. Dr. Randy Ham teaches it, he's awesome. It can be taught. You see, Jesus was a teacher, and my definition of a teacher is someone who has an overabundance of knowledge in, a, in some area, and has to share it. Has to. Can't keep it to himself. He has to share it. You know, one of my band directors thought about that, I guess. They thought, you know, if they share it, they're going to lose their mojo. I can't share it with somebody. Then I won't be able to play as well. That's not true. And Jesus just shows us that. By giving it away, you get more. That's what this is about. This, this giving of authority. And then he says to them, we've talked about how tough it is to be a disciple. Follow me here. Follow these directions. He says, take your staff and your sandals and a tunic. That's it. Because he knows a person's representative is as the person himself. That's what he's doing. That's the authority. And he says, don't take a, any bread with you. And this just doesn't mean a few slices. It actually means a loaf of bread. You can't take that with you. Don't take a loaf. He says, don't take a backpack. This is really a satchel. I'm just trying to be more contemporary. Don't take a backpack and don't take any copper coins is what they're really talking about. Don't, don't take any of that with you. And then you're to stay in one place as you're teaching in that town or village or whatever. Stay in one place. Don't move. So that people know where you are at. And if you're not received in some city, some town, or someone's house, you were to shake the dust off your feet at that place 
and walk away. You're not to make a big deal. Shake the dust off. And as I'm thinking of that dust coming off, I think of what happens on Maundy Thursday where Jesus washes their feet. Remember what Peter said? Then wash all of me. Give me a shower. And Jesus says, no. I only need to take the dust off of your feet. And that's what he tells them to do here. Get rid of the dust. There is sometimes included in this passage, maybe some of you remember this, it's parenthetical, but it says, and that place at the end of time will be more, more frowned upon than Sodom and Gomorrah. Whoa. That's some authority he gave them. That this place would be damned like Sodom and Gomorrah. Worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. I guess they think that's too tough for us to handle. It wasn't in our reading. And so they taught, they taught repentance, which means changing our paradigm, turning around, Facing God, that's what they taught. And they exercised demons, just as Jesus did. You need to know that this, this discipleship thing is handed down generation to generation to generation. Okay? And we as Lutherans believe that that the hands that touched Jesus and Jesus' hands touching them have been passed down through all those 2,000 years. I wonder where the authority went. Because I haven't heard of many bishops exercising demons or healing people. Just a thought. They also anointed people. They healed. They healed with oil. This was olive oil. It was a common medical practice in those days, and it still is. Many pastors and priests carry oil with them to the hospital. It's from Isaiah, first chapter at the sixth verse. We will be softened with oil. So here's what I want you to do. Keep remembering, we are disciples. We are asked to do this type of thing. We are not alone. We're all in this boat together. And we go out two by two or four by four, but not alone. I'd also like to uh, keep encouraging you to read Mark aloud. Uh, last time I preached, I mentioned that. So if you weren't here, try reading Mark aloud. You'll have this great grasp of the Jesus in this gospel and of his disciples and what it means to be a disciple. And then... Try this one. Avoid negativity. When you sense it, remove yourself from it. Weed your garden. That's an important one. And then remember that anywhere we go, we are always sent with the authority of Jesus Christ. Amen.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Growing in faith and discipleship, we give thanks for God's merciful compassion as we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Lord God, equip all your faithful people for the work of mission. When we are empty-handed, give us partners in ministry. Help us to speak boldly of your promises without reservation or fear. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, you breathe life into the dust of the earth. Bless the land and all who work it. Bring relief to areas of drought and famine. Send healing rains and cooling breezes to places scorched by sun and heat. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, when the nations are rebellious, raise up prophets and leaders to proclaim your way of justice. Provide for the needs of refugees, immigrants, asylum seekers, and exiles. Protect all who live in areas of war and conflict. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, your grace is sufficient to bring wholeness to human weakness. Restore hope to those suffering hardships, persecutions, and calamities. Strengthen all who are fragile in body, mind, or spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, renew our commitment to the work of hospitality. Help us to offer a caring welcome to visitors and to those returning to the church. Help us to be living examples of your grace and your generosity. Lord, in your mercy. We especially offer prayers of healing and wholeness this evening for Heidi Hartman, for her children and her husband, the Nathan Carlsons and the doctors, who are over her. We pray for Pat Newbold, for Denise and Jim Newbold, for Andrea Cross, for Connor Pettit, for Angie Myers, and for Dan McGowan. Lord God, you equip disciples throughout the ages to proclaim your kingdom. Lead us by faith until every weakness of this world has been made perfect in the power of your everlasting glory. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious God, we lift to you these prayers and the prayers of our hearts, trusting in your everlasting love and mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. O God most mighty, O God most merciful, O God our rock and our salvation, hear us as we praise. Call us to your table. Grant us your life. When the world was a formless void, you formed order and beauty. 
When Abraham and Sarah were barren, you sent them a child. When the Israelites were enslaved, you led them to freedom. Ruth faced starvation. David fought Goliath. And the psalmist cried out for healing. And full of compassion, you granted the people your life. You entered our sorrows in Jesus, our brother. He was born among the poor. He lived under oppression. He wept over the city. With infinite love, he granted the people your life. In the night in which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take and eat this is my body given for you do this in remembrance of me again after supper he took the cup gave thanks and gave it to all to drink saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering his death, we cry out, Amen. Celebrating his resurrection, we shout, Amen. Trusting his presence in every time and place, we plead, Amen. O oh God, you are breath. Send your spirit on this meal. O oh God, you are bread. Feed us with yourself. O oh God, you are wine. Warm our hearts and make us one. O oh God, you are fire. Transform us with hope. O God, most majestic, O God, most motherly, O God, our strength and our song, you show us a vision of the tree of life with fruits for all and leaves that heal the nations. Grant us such life, the life of the Father to the Son, the life of the Spirit to our risen Savior, life in you now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. They will come from the north and the south, the east and the west, and they will gather here at this table to share in the body and blood of our Lord and Savior. All is ready. Please come. This evening, we will be communing by intinction. So please hold the wafer in your hand until the wine comes.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen.